We're about to get it on like Donkey Kong, son. You better get that copy ready. Straight to the dome. Oh, yeah. Come on, man. Come on, kids. You guys ready for this? Are you ready to rock it out on Friday, November 12th? I hope you are. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. That's why you tune into the show. Ugh. Because you know, we're going to rock the ever living daylights out of this. Come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah, you're watching Paleo Crad Diaries. I am your host. The one and only, the OG, the original paleocrat. It's true, Jeremiah Bannister. Ah, you're watching me name Catholic. I got a whole bunch of awesome stuff coming up. Got a whole bunch of awesome stuff coming up here. Okay, so you're definitely going to want to stick around. In fact, you want to do more than that. Right now, you want right now, you want to get this stuff out. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Do it now. Wolfpack unite! <laughs> Wolfpack charge! We gotta do this. <sighs> Man, how pumped are you? <laughs> you know, it's gonna be a good weekend. I am going to be busy. I am gonna be busy. I've got a speech about enthusiasm tonight with a bunch of guys calling themselves the Inquisitors. So you gotta pray for your boy. Ow! Look. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> uh, it's just another day that we can be glad that we are alive that we can be glad to be taking a knee for Jesus Christ resolving in our hearts as we do each and every time to never give up to keep on smiling and to remember that we too one day shall die momentum more and so make the best of it dream bigger thoughts find out what you love pursue that Pray about it, discern it, and once God has given that to you, you give it everything you've got. Give it your best, and let God do the rest. Isn't it just about that simple? Isn't it just about that simple? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Hold on a second. Let me, let me pop this up here. Let me pop this up. Where is this? Where is this? There we go. There we go. I'm glad to see everybody there in the comments section. I don't know if something froze. What happened with this? What happened with this? <laughs> Where are you guys? Normally that thing is just going do, 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 do. Just bumping left and right. And for some reason, have no idea what's going on with that. Have no idea what's going on with that. Sometimes, sometimes it's the studio. We're going to find out. But before we do, I want to show you something really special. I want to show you something that really, really warms my heart. Okay? So here, I'm going to... There we go. There we go. I'm seeing it popping up. There we go. Jersey, hallelujah. Anthony Rodriguez, the whole gang. The whole gang is there. Yeah. And Anthony asked the Inquisitors. Yes. In fact, it is the Inquisitors. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what they go by. You know, a bunch of, bunch of traditional dudes, a bunch of tr traditional guys. And look, they're put, they are, they are um, very intelligent. Okay. These are dudes who their favorite thing to do is to read very, difficult and boring and essential books <laughs> that's like their whole life okay and they they hang out they go to the latin mass right they they hang out they go to diners and they debate sometimes obscure things <laughs> and so but they're they're friends of mine okay i used to go to a latin mass with them on mondays when it was at saint isidore here in town and uh the that's a sad situation by the way pray for the priest because the priest who was doing the latin mass he was older Right, he was much older, and he had a special love for it. And I was there for the last one when he did it the last time. And he uh, he went up to the altar. The altar boys are there with him doing a little mass. And all of a sudden, he just kind of stopped, and he leaned over to one of the, the young men, and they looked up at him, and they just nodded, and they stood up, and they all just left. And that was it. And they came out and said that he wasn't feeling well. 
Come to find out, it was the early stages of dementia. Okay, so reality for him in that moment at the altar, and you just got to imagine the sadness. I mean, my heart just broke for him because he, he, he had a special love. He didn't have to, to do that. He wanted to offer that for everybody, right, in town on, on a weekday, right? Because Saint, Saint, uh, Sacred Heart, where I go, that's where, you know, Sundays, we got that. Ain't no problem, you know, but it's a different thing. It's a different thing on Mondays. And so, you know, it's it was super sad, you know. But that's where they used to go. Now they go over to Sacred Heart because Sacred Heart started doing stuff on Mondays. So they go over there, right? And and these guys, they go to diners afterward. They have fun. They talk, everything else. It's super, super awesome. But they they somehow got word. Somehow, somehow they got word. <laughs> that your boy did a 20-part series on the Big Yellow Book. Right, and if you have not purchased the Big Yellow Book, we're gonna just lay out a whole bunch. I got, I'm basically pulling a David Halevit right here, okay, a Pax Domini. I've got a whole bunch of books in front of me because in the announcement portion, we got to do it. I mean, we are literally, we are, we are a pack of the books. We are, <laughs> we are a wolf pack of literature, and so we're constantly reading books. We got a book club, all this other stuff. We'll talk about that in a second. But I'm doing, a, I'm doing a, a speech on this. I'll try to make sure, and I'm not, I won't even try. I will have an audio version of that presentation, okay? Uh, it's in a home. I don't want to I don't want to have video all over the place, but I will do some live videos maybe on the way there. You're going to have to go to the uh, the Wolfpack chat on Telegram and you can find that all that right there in the description below. So you got to go check that out. But before we do any of that stuff, pulled up to work here. Here we go. Pulled up to work, okay? You've got Reason and Theology fans. Now I just started we just set it up for him yesterday. And I say we because it was the Wolfpack chat. The Wolfpack chat is at the forefront. In fact, not even the Wolfpack chat. The Wolfpack is at the forefront of all of this. I hope you feel it in your bones. I hope you feel it deep inside that it is something special. When, when because of you, because of people who tune into this show, the freaks and the geeks, right? Those howling at the sun. Those people, because of them, Telegram now has an, an awesome Telegram uh, chat for the guild that belongs to Meaning of Catholic. That's a patrons-only guild. But you want to see something bump and look, just since last night, just since last night, 62 messages over there. I mean, come on, give me a break. Give me a break. You know, since I, uh, since I started, you got like 12 over on the Wolfpack chat, right? So you go over, uh, tech, look. You, you want to get involved in a discussion, you go over there. That place is constantly bumping. It is a live stream just like it is over here, just like it is on YouTube, and it's just going all the time. So you want to find that out? You want to see that? Oh, see, I w it makes it look like I was, like, number one. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I think I was the number the, the first the first person to become a follower, right, other, or, or a member other than, of course, uh, Michael Lofton. Right? But I helped Michael Lofton set this stuff up. How powerful is that, guys? Not only Meaning of Catholic, not only Timothy Flanders, Michael Lofton. Reason and theology. They're catching the vision and realizing that there is a powerful community-building tool right there at their disposal. Now all we got to do is we got to flood it with members. <laughs> it's got to be bumping like ours. It's got to be bumping like ours. There's only so much those 15 members are going to do. So we got to make it go. You got to make it just boom, 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 boom. It's what you got to do, man. Yeah. And so over there, over there, you've got the Paleocrat Diaries Wolfpack chat. Let's see what that is. Boom. 145 at 150. We're going to have ourselves a special little, special little party, a special little hoedown. That's what we're going to do. You know, and, and how, how cool is it? Because, of course, someone said yesterday, they're like, look, there's like 600 comments a day on the Wolfpack chat. And I said, that's a kind of a slow day. <laughs> I said, but yes, I know. There's 600. He said, well, how, why would I, <laughs> how, how do you possibly go through all those comments? And I'm like, you think I do that? <laughs> I have robots. <laughs> I, have, I have Wolfgang and Louie do it, you know, on their Fisher Price computer. I've got them doing it. <laughs> my boys, my boys are taking care of the business. But if you look, I take, I take stuff from, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a, a giveaway. City of God versus City of Man. 
uh, Phil from the Wolfpack chat has uh, donated one of them, been willing to donate one of them, and we're going to do a kind of kind of raffle or something like that, something where people would be able to uh, to uh, have an opportunity to win the new book by Timothy Flanders. I've heard nothing but rave reviews of this. Nothing but but rave reviews. They said it, that, that he obviously did enormous amounts of study for this. The graphs in the front, they said were amazing. Uh, the history in it is just so deep. It's powerful. People want me to talk about it, but I talk to the guy all the time. I said, look, I can probably sneak into his house and go and grab myself a copy. <laughs> probably a signed one. He's like, where did that signed copy go? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm reading it, drinking coffee through his straw. So, you know, it's like, but yeah, you, I, I kind of whittle it all down. So what I think is cool, yeah, what I think is cool over there, right, including prayer requests, memes that people make, because that's one of the things people do, promoting other channels, promoting books, right, praising people for going out and having, buying the young man's guide or young woman's guide, things like that, okay, different, it's, yeah, we want to make shirts with stuff like this on it. So, I mean, I, I go ahead and I take stuff that people post, ranging from serious to absolutely ridiculous, and I condense it down. I, my Paleocrat channel, at Paleocrat, is the abridged version. It is the abridged version of the Wolfpack channel. So, you got to go check it out. All those all those links are in the description below, including, and I, I think it would be including and should, includes the, the prayer chain where we, we normally add pray every day. I've been trying to do it most every day. Yesterday, I wasn't able to. Okay, I'm sorry. Wasn't able to do it. Wasn't able. But most most days, we pray, even with a video and audio, we go through different readings, things like that. And so we've actually been going through on, on that channel, we've been going through this, right? True Devotion to Mary, St. Uh, Louis de Montfort. We've been going through that. You can find that at the prayer chain. Any, any prayer request you got. You can also, of course, record prayers. You can just do an audio recording and it shares it on the on the timeline. So you go, hey, look, somebody asked a prayer for somebody with a, a blood clot in the back of their brain, right? And said, look, this person is in real real danger. It's a really dangerous thing. They really need your help. Please pray for them. People right away praying, and not not your thoughts and prayers thing. Thoughts and prayers, man. Thoughts and prayers. Sending the energy waves. <laughs> I'm, I'm sending the energy. I'm sending mad thoughts, bro, into the universe. No, we're not doing that. Praying. Praying from the heart for people to say, look, we, we commit to this endeavor because we believe it's at the center of how we deal with the malaise of our secular age, period. Bottom line, end of story. Beginning of journey. It's what we're doing. So you want to join that that right there? You can find the Wolfpack Prayer Chain. Okay, we have a book club where we are going through. And I don't, look, I'm just saying. I'm just saying book club, boom, bam. Look at this, folks. Look at this, Interior Castle, Teresa of Avila. Every couple weeks we have ourselves a live chat where everybody gets in and they talk about the book and what they think about the book and what they've learned. Powerful, right? By the way, the, the, the moderator of the prayer chain, Haley Luya, the moderator right in here, the moderator of the, uh, the book club, what we call the Canine Brigade, uh, that is Veronica. She's our, our librarian Brit bot. She's from England. She's living in London. So it's kind of a funky time for that, but everything is saved. All the all the the discussions that we have, those are saved. You can you can not only watch them, you can download them completely for free directly from the site. There you go, boom. Last thing, make sure next uh, next Monday. This is just the last uh, announcement I got. They're kind of tied together here. Um, on next Monday, this upcoming Monday, uh, there's going to be in the morning. In the morning, there's going to be a discussion between me and uh, Mr. Kennedy Hall over the concept of liberalism. And it's going to be at five in the morning. OK, I, you know, blame Kennedy for that. <laughs> Do not blame me. I am not the guy that says five in the morning. Interestingly enough, <laughs> you might hate me for this. I'm actually on time there. I'm actually on time every time. It's not my show. It's not my show. So I don't feel like I can just, you know, drag the folks along. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you guys are with me. Come on, man. Come on, you got to be cool. But but you know, I'm bringing I'm bringing the beast. 
I'm bringing, I'm bringing the, the massive treasure trove of, of amazing uh, information here from the Kingship of Christ, Principles of St. Thomas Aquinas, okay, by the very Reverend uh, Dennis Fahey, as well, of course, as the social rights of our divine Lord, Jesus Christ, the King, okay? So both of these, bunch of stuff from there, and I decided, in fairness, in fairness to Kennedy, right, and not just dropping encyclical stuff, because I got, you know, I got my, I got my, my big batch. <laughs> I do my treasure trove of encyclicals, and so the thing is, and I printed them out. The um, and I encourage other people to do stuff similar to this too. I think you know why not? It's over at the um, encyclicals, the Vatican site there for that. Um, but the thing is, is that that I said, look, he's SSPX, right? So his missile that he carries around recognizes John the twenty third. Uh, Pope St. John, the 23rd. And so I said, well, I'm going to stick with the encyclical. So I'm giving him a hint. I'm giving him a hint, man, saying, look, you got to read it, dude. <laughs> you got to read it, son. And you got to guess where I'm coming from. So that's at 5 in the morning. And then at 11, I'm not going to change the time. In fact, if I change anything, I'll change the time to this show. I'm sorry to tell you. To 11, because that, I, that was easy to be ready and prepared. I wasn't scrambling around and... I would have had time even that day to go to mass in the morning. So that it might happen. I'm not saying it will yet, but it's it's possible. But we're going through a series right now. We just began last week uh, our series on um, how not to be secular. It's a book here by James K.A. Smith. We're going through that. And that is based, of course, on the massive tome, uh, A Secular Age. And I got I got some people uh, posting. I love the guy that posted it. Great guy. You know, but he, he posted in the Wolfpack chat. Something about, something about you know people busting the chops of Charles Taylor and saying ah Charles Taylor man, Charles Taylor he's like he's like he's saying a bunch of stuff with a bunch of these fancy words that all you need is a high school d d diploma to be able to understand. <laughs> and and it was boiled down to the most ridiculous nonsense. I said for one it wasn't even a quote from the book. It's a quote from some interview he did. What do you do? Whoop de do actually I actually expected better the guy that wrote the article. He's one of the one of the people published over at Imaginative Conservative. He ought to be doing better than that. That was pretty It was pretty dumb, dude. Pretty dumb. But more than that, more than that, it, it was another site that was boiling down to this notion that, well, you know, really all that it is is the Protestant Reformation happened in the 1500s. And because the Protestant Reformation, set, what, what, what happened since then? Because that's the frame of, of Charles Taylor. He said, and he uses that just as an example. He just says, what has happened since the 1500s that made it so that we no longer have just an assured notion of like who we're talking to is probably in all likelihood a Christian. And if you are in the West, in all likelihood a Catholic. And if you're anywhere else, increasing likelihood that you're going to be a Catholic. How did that happen? And, and, and someone's like, it comes down, it's all it is, is the Protestant Reformation. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's an interplay of many, many, many variables. Otherwise, what kind of weird thing is that the Protestant Reformation is what just crushed us all? <laughs> it's an interplay of things. Some of those things, in fact, that the church has done. It's called blowback or unintended consequences. Do better. <laughs> Do better than that. <sighs> the interplay of technologies, the interplay of, of philosophies, even of things like etiquette and how, how morals are diffused to the masses via the elites. You sit there and you say, man, how, how are you going to say that that is something that's like you just need a high school diploma? Really, what kind of high school are you going to, dude? What kind of high school are you going to, weirdo? <laughs> yeah, and I tell you. Okay, all right, we got to move on. Before we get into the octagon, because we're going to get into the octagon of history here. We're going to be talking about Father Lassant. And I'm skipping over, and I think people are going to be surprised, maybe even disturbed. <laughs> they might be disturbed. I'm dead serious. How many, how many people out there right now? In the comment section, or if you're listening to the show, just let me know. In fact, raise your hand, okay? Ra raise your hand. I don't care if, if there's people around you. Who cares? 
They're going to be like, why is that person raising their hand? And they're like, I don't know. That person also howls sometimes. <laughs> so I, I don't know what's going on with Johnny Q and Sally Sue over there. I have no clue. But they seem like they're having some fun, you know, and they're living this, like, crazy awesome life, striving to be a saint and stuff. But, um... <laughs> Oh, where was I even going with all of this? <laughs> where was I even going with all of this? Um, saint maker, I think. <laughs> was it the saint maker? Is that where I... Oh, no, no, no. Scandalized. <laughs> Not scandalized. Disturbed. Disturbed. I, I get all wrapped up, man, thinking about old Johnny Q and Sally Sue and thinking about, you know, the work day. And we're going to talk about that, of course. But Father Lassance, there's people out there right now who are already buying the books by Father Lassance. And I don't think that the 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 part that will razzle some people i don't think that that's in the girl's guide i think it's only in the men's guide and it's right after he talks about apologetics he talks about the need to live a holy life he talks about the need to evangelize which is basically you know half the book so far which is why we've titled it about apologetics but then he gets to a part about the love of god and our reason to hope and in that section, he talks about um, the number of people who will go to heaven. Okay, now most of the people who bought this book and most of the people probably who listen to the show are probably already to some degree familiar with Father Lassance because of his amazing, his, his, his absolutely remarkable must-have missile. So they look at it and say, man, this is the most hardcore missile on the planet. The, the indulgence prayers all this stuff, super hardcore. And then they go and they buy the book and they read something in there that he is of a milder position that believes that the majority of adult Catholic people are going to be going to heaven. And more than that, that he's even open to different ideas regarding how many people overall are going to go to heaven. And he takes a milder position. He goes against those who say that they're uh, will be a small number of people. He wraps them up with the Jansenists. And he says that they were, they, they culminated in Jansenism. Now, I don't know how fair he was being in a way, because people who watch the show may also have <laughs> a book on the number of those who shall be saved by, it's just a small little pamphlet. And it's, it's got select portions and stuff like that from a doctor of the church, St. Alphonsus Liguori. And he takes a position quite contrary, in fact, to this. And, but, but, what's amazing about this, <laughs> and I know we're, we're going to have to talk about it, and I, I may even have people on with different, different opinions on this issue and allow them to hash it out. And for me to moderate and just bring up ideas about, well, what do you say about this? These are, these are ideas from the book. Okay, ideas from the manuals about salvation and the number of those who shall be saved. And, and, and you got to remember, people say, they could say, well, wait a second. He sounds like he's into that Balthazar stuff. He sounds reasonable hope man. He quotes a guy who most definitely is. He quotes a guy who's definitely into the mildest of the mild view on the matter. Okay. Hopeful, hopeful beyond what most people would say, well, I don't know how reasonable that is. But he quotes him. But then he quotes St. Ambrose at length. And so people can say, well, so what about, so what about uh, St. Alphonsus? And you'd say, say St. Alphonsus is a doctor of the church. And you'd say, St. Ambrose. <laughs> and it's a long quote about this. And he quotes other saints about this. And says, look, there's a reason. It has not, there's no official declaration about the number of people we're not out there saying 100, you know, 120,000 people, 122,000. We're not playing that game, man. We ain't playing that game. And so the thing is, is that I didn't want to cover that today. I didn't want to cover that issue and get into the scuffle because I thought, what's the best way for this program to be able to address that particular topic? Other than just me talking, you know. I said, what's, what's the best way? And I thought, I need to get some folks on. I want to actually reserve that. I want to reserve that topic as a kind of a, a topic on its own, even out of sequential order of the book, and just say, because it wasn't talked in both guides. And I want to remind people, too. I want to remind people, too, that, that uh, you know, when, when, 
when he talks about it, right? When he talks about it, he's talking about it within the framework of an apologetic method that requires you to go out that, in fact, he's more insistent on using premise to conclusion argumentation than I am. You know what I mean? Like, he's more into that jam than I am to say, look, you got to go out. Here's the argument you want to lay forth, yada, yada, yada. But then he also talks about that you need to be living that example by the heart because otherwise, how would people be able to see you? And if they don't see you as that living epistle, how could they possibly come to the truth and the saving truth of Jesus Christ? How could they do that? And so it's a mystery. (laughs) It's a mystery. Isn't, um, isn't it a mystery? And no, David the Hermit, the church does not now teach that everyone goes to heaven. No. Yeah. It seems to be all you hear now these days. Come on, man. You're better than that. You're better than that, David the Hermit. <laughs> Don't say that, man. Do not say that. You're better than that, home slice. All right. So, Saint Maker, make sure. Check it out. You got you to gotta love it. You got to like it. Okay. Make sure you go. I guess they don't have a drop down. I've been playing phone tag with the guy from uh, from the Saint Maker, okay? I've been playing phone tag with him. It's actually a bummer because he was away for a while. He ended up getting, uh, he got a little COVID. He got a little COVID and he was kind of, you know, under the weather for a minute. <laughs> and so um, he's back now and he's trying to connect with me, but I don't think he's watching my show. I don't think he's watching my show at all. And I'm like, dude, bro. Like, you know, you know, he calls at times, man, I, but so do other people I know, <laughs> other Catholic people who are like, bro, I love your show. And I'm like, no, you don't. You're calling during my show. <laughs> and, you, and you're like, yeah, what, what's up today? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What am I doing? But, you know, make sure, uh, you know, go check it out. Even if you're out of the country, I'm talking to the folks. I'm trying to figure out wh- what's the reason behind that cost? Why is it that they're, they're not able to do certain things? What's up with that? You know, and I'll, I'll, I am striving to get answers for you. In the meantime, in the meantime, you got to check it out. You got to go check it out. The, the color grading, you can't really see the actual color. This is like a teal. Okay. So the color is a little bit different. My color grading for the, for the screen is, I got a LUT on that. So this is actually like a, a teal color and it's just absolutely beautiful. And the way that they lay everything out, absolutely remarkable. I will allow the uh, the promo here to tell you how awesome it is. Of course, that's me talking on that promo. <laughs> and then make sure to go check out that affiliate page at the end. And once uh, once we're done with that, we're getting right into the action. I will introduce the beer that I am drinking today. Uh, compliments of Tridentine Brewing Company. So I will I will let you know which which brew I'm going to be drinking. But make sure right now grab that coffee. Grab, if, if you can drink beer right now, some of you are listening at night, right? I'm, I'm going to be like reaching down in the drawer at work. <laughs> you got a flask. You're like pulling it out. <laughs> Paleo told me. I'm like, no, I did not tell you. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And so, but make sure to go get that right now. We will be back in about 90 seconds with more of the Friday, November, November 12th edition of Paleo Crad Diaries right here at Meaning of Catholic. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself, but in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction, and our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough. And most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now, find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited though. 
So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it. You got to do it right now. Saintmaker.com slash Paleocrat Diaries. And you got to buckle in, kiddos. You got to buckle in. And why? Because check this out. Yeah, that's the music. <laughs> that's the music. This right here is the beer. Okay? Check it out, kids. Check it out, kids. I have to, right? <laughs> We're drinking and driving on this in this car right now. In the Paleomobile. In the Paleomobile, right? It's a DeLorean. We're hopping in. We got the wings. We pull it down. All the lights are glimmering behind us, just like in Back to the Future, but even cooler. <laughs> and we're sitting there. I look over. I see the gang, the whole crew. They're all dressed like Doc. I don't know why. And they look at me and they say, because the reason why is because we are going through the Tour de Force known as the guides for young and old, parenthetical me, young men and women. That's what we're doing. Father Lassance. We're going back to find out how did we get here? Who are we? Why are we here? What's this all about? What is the heart of the matter at the foundation, at the roots, to recognize that this secular age that we are abiding in, that we are enduring right now, these tumultuous times, totally terrible knowing how it got here, knowing what it does even to us, what it does to those around us, and how we, as faithful people striving to be saints on that path of salvation and perfection, when we do that, what must we do? What must we think? What must we say? That's what we do here. That's how we're rolling here. Because we got a massive mandate, don't we? We have a massive mandate. We need to go out. We need to make disciples. Starting, of course, with ourselves and once we do this we are living epistles we are beaming lights in this world the darker it gets the brighter we burn it's the way it works and that's what we're doing here to understand sometimes sometimes people get all sorts of frustrated they don't understand they're like what am i supposed to do i feel like it's out of my control because it is outside your control abandon yourself to the lord take a knee every day resolve to never give up to keep on smiling and to momentum mori because he's the king. Because he's the king. And we're pressing those rights as children of God. The way it works. The way it works. Christine, by the way, glad to see you in the comments section. Super glad, by the way. Super glad, Christine. Same thing with Giovanni. Same thing with Giovanni. I hope that, uh, I'm sorry, man, I wasn't able to do any uh, prayer stuff yesterday. Uh, yesterday for the kids, because I know that you've been <laughs> you've been using that man so that the kids can uh, can uh, uh, go to sleep. <laughs> you're like you're like guys, just listen to Jeremiah pray, and they're like, okay, okay, Papa, <laughs> they have to fall asleep. Oh, <laughs> and so it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Glad to see you. Glad to see VM. She's over in London. Giovanni is over in Australia. Uh, we've got David the Hermit. He's a hermit. He's hiding. I don't know where he is. I don't. I don't know how. I don't know how the hermit even has technology like that. <laughs> What's going on? Are you a modernist, David? <laughs> What's going on? I actually, David's cool, man. David. David followed my stuff over at Holy Faith Media, right? Now you want people think this is crazy. You know, we we have we have the 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 humbuggers, right? <laughs> Paleo Crack's always joking around. He's always trying to have fun all the time, <laughs> thinking life is sweet and stuff. Those people, right? Um, they would really, really hate my old show. <laughs> he can tell you. He can tell you they would hate it. And why? Because it was way more like the, the first half of the show was fun. I would talk about viral videos and silly stories, sometimes just completely, uh, you know, like like um, Babylon B, stuff like that. You know, I would talk about it, but treat it as though it was real. Treat it as though it was real. And we, and we covered, of course, and this is actually very important, and I do feel as if I've let all of humanity down at least as little itsy weets. and that is that um, we used to talk all the time about the great animal uprising of 2020. I, I shouldn't have named it that because it led to the impression that the uprising was going to end in 2020. That's just when it initiated, guys. <laughs> that's, when they, that's when they let the floodgates loose. That's when you started seeing raccoons going into banks and stealing stuff. That's when you started seeing geese being, you know, people taking geese as pets on walks and into bars and junk. That's when you started seeing bears on top of cop cars. That's when you started seeing all that. Deer busting through windows like crazy. Right? 
the, the feud between the cats and the dogs and how the dogs, we finally figured out that the dogs had manipulated us for a very long time into believing the very false assumption, probably some kind of Hollywood propaganda, that dogs are, in fact, man's best friend. This is just simply not true. Cats, in fact, are man's best friend. <laughs> It's true. That's a fact. That's a, that, is, that is a proven fact. <laughs> Nobody can debate that anymore, right? Nobody can debate that anymore. It's kind of like the same thing, you know, that an an Antarctica is a big ice wall around us. <laughs> it's one of those things. You, you can't debate it anymore, okay? <laughs> oh, man. So, okay, but look, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Yes, wolves are animals, man. And, we, and this is the uprising. This is the Great Awakening. And didn't we say, you know, I, well, I said, and I believe a lot of people, it's not, I didn't come up with this on my own, but the idea that we live in a time that's so wicked that there's really only a couple ways out of this, and there's historical precedent for all of them, okay? Mm. I must hold on. Mm. Mm. This is Life is Worth Living. It's actually the name of it. <laughs> yeah, Life is Worth Living, 4.5%. That is my only criticism thus far. These are beers that are like, you know, standard kind of, you know, 4, 5, 6%. I'm an Imperial Stout kind of guy. So if they ever do make a Paleo Crat Stout, or if they ever make a Wolfpack Chat Stout, we're going to need to have that bugger like, you know, 14%. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm dead serious. With coffee in it, it's got to have a lot of the coffee flavor. It's got to have a lot of the chocolate fa uh, flavor. But this right here, this is the Irish Red Ale. You know, I like mixing it up too, right? I have preferences. I, I say, yeah, okay, that's that's the preference. But, you know, anyway. So, oh, man, that's so good. Um, <laughs> the thing is, is that, uh, you know, we we live in a time that there's really only a couple ways out. Okay, there's only a couple ways out, um, historically speaking. And, and, and I, I'm of the persuasion already, and I've said this before, that civilizations and stuff like that, that they have lifespans, okay? High cultures, I talk about how a high culture develops, how it advances, how it reaches a point where it moves from interior to exterior, and you can see this in the skyline where it used to be, let's say, the steeple that you would see from afar, and you could, you could just anticipate that the center of the town, at the center of that town, was some kind of a religious, a religious building where it was a communal understanding of themselves and the world around them. And that eventually, this ends up getting eclipsed by economic man. And economic man, as the high culture develops, it becomes more exterior. It's not so focused anymore on the interior life. Because the focus on the interior brings advancement. It will inevitably, in a social theory, the focus on the interior life and an understanding of the interplay, the porous interplay and exchange between what we call natural and, and what would be supernatural, okay, what would be spiritual or transcendent and what is around us now, that interplay, that the more that we are, we are uh, interior in our thoughts, like how do I change my life? How does how God affecting my heart? How does the soul work? What is the soul? We have these questions. And when we do that, um, that that society, number one, is going to end up being pretty united in the beginning, of course. And over time, though, that brings prosperity about. They get better. And the thing is, you know, people, they say, well, you know, you get fatter, you know, <laughs> you, you get lazier. Kind of like when people talk about Rome and how Rome developed and stuff. That's just one of many high cultures that that happened to. But you reach a place, and I've talked about this, where you have, when, when you're on the down, right? You're, you're, you're coming down from the high of your civilization, and everything's falling apart. By that time, you're balkanized. By that time, all these various groups are not only disagreeing with each other, there's really very little point of connection. There's very little point of contact between them, whereas before you had kind of a social fabric. And that social fabric, fabric just gets unknotted and untwisted and untied. Right, it gets unraveled all over the place because of sin, ultimately. Right, because of sin and the 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 switching of priorities again that you can see in the skyline of a city. That all of a sudden now the big monumental things are man oriented; they're money oriented. And when that happens, and those divisions are taking place, 
and men are and women are looking outside themselves only, primarily, it gets to a place where eventually it could be a a um, an eminent frame, a kind of exclusive humanism that even the, even those civilizations that still recognized God or the gods to them, that they that they would look at it and say, you know, yeah, I still believe, but that belief was no longer anything more than just kind of a, a nostalgic or a, a practical hangover. They were running on fumes. It's like unbelievers who still celebrate Christmas. Their kids will eventually figure it out and say, why do you do that? Why, why do we do that at all? And they're going to have to change the game. They're going to have to come up with an answer or just stop. And now the next thing you know, Festivus is the answer. Everybody's doing a Festivus poll. And it, it, as a replacement, not even just as a fun thing to do, but saying, no, no, we, it's Festivus time. <laughs> it's what it is. It changes the symbols. It changes the spirituality. It changes the, the, uh, the social dynamic of a society. It changes the way that we the, the the way that we exchange ideas, the way that we exchange goods and services, all this stuff. When that happens, when that happens, it reaches such a degree that it becomes nothing more than power, power and money. And when that happens, we have serious conflict. It's a hot contention, right? It's a flash. So it's like you 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 see this intersection of emerging ideas and the and the civilization going down. And you say that emerging idea, that emerging worldview, when it finally reaches enough power that you now have, for all practical intents and purposes, two different political paradigms. You have uh, uh, politics in the truest sense that they would be able to amount, they, they have a certain amount of power within that society that they could, in fact, make war. People have been afraid of that. People in modern times have been afraid of, of these wars and what, what could possibly come about from this. How can we possibly resolve the situation? And that's not entirely unfounded. That's a, that's a completely reasonable reaction to the situation to say, what can we do? And if you feel that it's completely outside your control, and, and, and by control, I mean that you've got your hands over and you're like, oh, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm manipulating it here. I'm moving this chess piece and moving that. For one, when, when have you ever been able to do that? For one, <laughs> be honest. Right. And, and the other thing is, is that that really it's God anyway. But in that situation, in that setting, we find ourselves with a couple options. You are either going to have blood. You will. You will either. Ha and this could be a both. And I don't, I don't want to make it a strict either or I don't want to say it's going to be this or that. I want to say it could be both. You're either going to have war where there will be blood. Or. You will have conversion. So you will end up having, right, a, a, a maybe a revolution of some kind, right? It doesn't matter if it's from, you know, which side starts first. doesn't matter. It's to that place where they're already there. They're already clashing. We can see it in the symbols that shine at us from the screens. We can see it. We can feel it. But once you get to that place, you're either going to have some kind of a, um, you know, a revolution or you're going to have a revival. And I've made, because we have that in history, we have the Great Awakenings. And people say, well, look, yeah, we had Great Awakenings. It got super bad. <clears throat> it got super bad. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a bunch of people felt terribly bad for the things that they had done. They got on their knees and they, pray, they cried out to the Lord. We learned, though, <laughs> that in the book Enthusiasm, they didn't just get on their knees. These folks were shaking and quaking and acting insane. There was serious nonsense involved in that. And unsurprisingly, there were, there were statistically, there were major time problems that, that within 15 years, the amount of drunkenness through the roof, the amount of illegitimate children through the roof. And why? Because enthusiasm tends to be sensual. It tends to be sensual. And so... The problem is it's an experiential mode. The, the great awakenings are experiential. They say, I, 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 I'm having an experience. I feel terribly bad. But the depth of the, what they're getting is that you have an experience. You have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost illuminates you and gives you these visions and gives you these ideas and leads you personally, you yourself, leads you to the truth. And it's not tethered to the infallible institution of the Catholic Church. It's not tethered to it. And because it's not tethered to it, 
it ends up going all sorts of crazy, which is why even the, 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 the revivalists of the Great Awakening end up falling to pieces. And so that's why in my analysis of this, and, and I say, look, if you've got different ideas, throw them out there. There's all different ones. You know, I guess, I, I guess Tim Flanders is talking about people moving and living close to each other in communities. And so the thing is, you know, like there are different beliefs. They might be closer to like the Benedict option or whatever, right? But for me and mine, for me and mine, I, I'm, not, I'm not running out and hiding anywhere, right? I'm going through books like this. And you can do both, I guess. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying pray about that. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be the, the folks who might, let's say, move. That they move to, you know, a city or a state far away to be part of a project. You know, I have friends who did it. They're libertarians. They're some of my favorite people in the world, right? Catholic people, they're libertarian. They um, were atheists before. Well, uh, the wife was raised Roman Catholic, um, but she became an atheist, her and her husband both. And we were part of the same organization, Center for Inquiry. We were, both, we were all on the board for the state chapter here in Michigan. And so... They're, they're loving the Lord now, sending their kids to this kind of school, but they moved uh, to uh, Sacred Heart, where we send our kids, and, but they moved to, to uh, New Hampshire to be part of that project that gets people together to create, you know, let's say like a, a libertarian city kind of thing, or to have enough libertarians that move there that it really influences uh, and moves the dial. And when he got there, he found that there was a whole bunch of divisions. Yeah. And Andrea says, Catholic villages could be a good solution to avoid all the madness that surrounds us. I'm glad you put the word could in there. Uh, you know, I mean, look, it, it could. It could. But we even, we even found an enthusiasm. Isn't that the idea of setting up a Zion, setting up some kind of safe haven like this? That oftentimes, um, now, I, I would understand it, for example, if they're coming out and they're killing you. I mean, I, I, look, if, if, they're, if they're coming in and they're killing you, and you're actually in the catacombs, but people are faking right now. People are fakers when they talk that way. They say, we're in the catacombs right now. And they're tweeting that from their church <laughs> downtown. And they're laughing outside. Oh, yeah, man, check out this tweet I did. And their buddies are like, hey, man, you want to come over and have a barbecue? Yeah, it sounds good to me. They never talk about the idea that any police are going to come in and knock on their door. Never, ever, never. None of them are like, dude, did you see, you know, Brother Jim and Sister Susan? Did you see that they were burned recently in a coliseum? The lions ate them, dude, and where you're on your knees praying for the repose of their souls. They ain't having those conversations. They're faking. <laughs> and so people can jump the shark. People can jump the shark. And why do that when you can do something that is less intrusive, that is less demanding upon you, and which has an optimistic outlook of how you can engage in the world? And that's not to say that, that well, you can have an optimistic view that says, I have hope that if I do this stuff that Jeremiah is talking about, that by the time I'm dead, we're going to be running all politics and all the people who are in politics will be traditional Catholics. Yay! No! <laughs> that anybody who tells you that is a snake oil salesman. They are. That is a, that is a, that is a snake oil salesman that is telling you that that's the way it's going to work. And yeah, David's right. Nowhere's safe if they want to get you. But at least you'd have a reason to run, right? <laughs> at least you'd have a reason to go somewhere and say, I don't necessarily need to stay here. It's, and, and people can say, well, you know, why would you run? Why not just stand and, and say, you know, this is the way Providence is working. And I say, I say the same thing if you're at the bottom of a mountain and a big boulder is coming down. I, if, you, if you told me, you know, hey, well, you know, the Lord moved that boulder. <laughs> I'd say, no, let's move you out of the way, buddy, you know, and push you out of the way. Same thing if a, if a car is coming at you or whatever, right? But we have a good reason to hope. We have a good reason to hope. And part of that is because we, we have followed a path for a long time that is completely, completely infected by the world. In fact, it's one of my contentions on the show that bothers people the most is that so much of what we do, even as traditional Catholic people, so much of what we do is infected by notions that didn't come from saintly books. It came from the interplay of our existence, our living and moving and having our being in a world that through time and space develops various technologies 
that develops various etiquettes that that in the early days of something, you might have very strong disagreements with it, but now we use it. For example, how many traditional people are using interstate highways? Do they not know that interstate highways were extremely controversial for people who believed in tradition, localism, family? Do they not know that? Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't, but they use them. And if you bring it up, they go, I don't know about that. Sometimes, well, I mean, look, there's a good utility for it. And say, then you're a good utilitarian. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and, and again, we don't even understand to the extent that it has affected us, to the extent that we are outward thinking, to the extent that we rely all of our views on politics and economics. And say, well, you know what? All I do all day long is I get on Twitter and I'm click activated like crazy. I'm all lit up. And that's what people are doing. I'm super trad. That's what trads did. No, it is not. No, it is not. Did I put that disclaimer at the beginning of the show? <laughs> I think I forgot it. <laughs> He's going to be like, you're, you're speaking thunder right now. I'm not. I'm echoing great people. I'm echoing great people. Okay? Now, enough of all that. All right. Oh, hold on. Let me, let me get this off here. Or so, okay, window capture. Let me get that off. By the way, thank you, all of you. Make sure like, comment, and share, subscribe. You got to do it. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Make it happen. Make it happen. You know, this this show, you know, there are people who really love this show, and they tune in. And, you know, some some folks, look, Nick. I learned about this guy named uh, Nick. His wife hopped into the Wolfpack chat, and she's like, my husband's talking about Jeremiah Bannister in this Wolfpack chat, like, all the time. <laughs> and she wanted to know what we're about. You know, is it like a cult or something? <laughs> you know, she didn't ask that. But she was serious about, like, you know, well, what what is the aim of all this? What is the aim of all this? We need more Nicks out there. We do. We need more folks like Nick out there. We need more folks like Jacob Fowler out there. They, they go around and they're telling people, people say, well, you know, on the radio, mentioning my name, I've never heard of that paleocrat. And for him to say, not yet, you will, <laughs> right? Like you'll understand the wolf pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And going out and just getting that out there and talking to people and saying, look, become part of this community. We're, we're, we're able to learn from each other. I'm not a magic man coming down a mountain. I'm not walking down with my with, with <laughs> some stone tablets. <laughs> Listen to what I've got to say. <laughs> Here's my analysis. My analysis is final. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. By the way, yeah, have a good one. Have a good one, Andrea. Yeah, glad to see you in the comments, man. Yeah, really cool guy. Pray for us, buddy. Okay. But Christian Apologetics. So you say, well, how do we deal with the world? Christian apologetics. You say it's a branch of theology that defends Christianity against all objections. Go to 1 Peter 3. We've been quoting 8 through 18. We don't have to go through all of it again. But the idea is, and you can read it on the screen, I encourage you, read it all the time. Get, get that into your, get it into your mind because you got to deverm yourself. You got to deverm yourself because you got, you got worms in the, in the brain. You may not even realize it individualism, hyper-individualism, notions regarding liberty that have not been tempered by the wisdom of the church. So much of this stuff that we, we rely on and say, yeah, I believe in this and that. I believe I have the right to do this and that. I believe I can publish whatever I want. You start doing that stuff, you got verms on the brain. You got to be devermed, homie. You got to be devermed. And the thing is, the way you get devermed is by reading passages like the one from per, from first Peter. You must. Right? To think the same thoughts, share the same feelings, be lovers of the brethren, be tender-hearted, modest and humble. Not repaying injury with injury, hard words with hard words. If you want to know, you know, it, I think that there are folks <laughs> I think that there are folks who read stuff like this and they just assume that they do this really well. And they don't realize sometimes that they may not hardly ever do it. And maybe they've passed up really big opportunities to do it. And if you want to see how that plays out and how hard that is, 
and how crazy when it's when you're taken off guard by something really, really injurious. And I mean that repaying injury with injury. The last episode, I had somebody in the comments. I had somebody in the comments. I, I'd mentioned my daughter. I brought her up about really, you know helping us to come back to the faith and stuff. And um, somebody somebody asked a question and brought her into it in a way that was extraordinarily uh, presumptuous at best. I, I'm I'm being charitable. I'm trying. And everything inside of me was furious. Everything inside of me, I wanted to wreck him. I told people later, I was crying. I, after the show was over, I was literally weeping. I didn't even make it two minutes off the show, and I had my head on this desk, and I'm bawling my brains out. Because inside of me, there was a hatred that was born that said, I want to wreck that person. I want to destroy them. I want to rid the world of this. And, and, and I, have a, I have the microphone. I could go as long as I want. I could spin that dude like a dreidel for 20 hours. And I still wouldn't have felt like... <clears throat> I still wouldn't have felt like it was enough. I wouldn't have felt like it was enough. Because it was literally being born in anger and rage, fury and fire, hatred. But then I saw that verse. I did. I saw it. It was still on the screen. And I knew in that moment, because I started going off on him. And I changed it up. I don't know if people can find the timestamp of that and put it in the comments for people. I'll put it in the I'll put it in the description, I think, after the show. To say, look, this is the kind of thing. And I mean, it's not to prop myself up. It's just simply to say that's what this is talking about. And I'm not gonna I'm not just gonna read over that and gloss over that. I'm not gonna ever forget. That moment that happened in the last show. I'm not going to forget that. And I wasn't lying about my daughter and what my daughter thought about my, me, my humor, my show, stuff like that. And I proved it because I took screenshots of every single post. It's still available. You can go. I took screenshots of posts that she had on her Facebook page before she died. I took four of them. I shared them. What she thought about my humor, what she thought about my voice, what she hoped for my show, and what she thought of me as a writer telling the story of our family. Yeah, man. But it hurt. It hurt. But no matter what, no treacherous words. Keep your tongue clear of harm. Right? Keep it clear of harm. He says, neglect the call to evil. Do good. Let peace be all thy quest and aim. Right? He talks about all this stuff. He says, you know, uh, uh, what is good inspires your ambitions. Like, you need to, um, if, if, you, if you have people coming against you, and we most certainly do, then we have to simply allow good to be what's inspiring us because if that's the case, who is to do you wrong? And if you're going to suffer for the cause of right, then you're actually blessed for that. I know a lot of people who say that they're blessed, but they act as though they, it's the worst thing in the world. just true and we need to get better at that we need to recognize if it's a blessing then why am I so mad and we need to get sin out of our lives he talks about uh, uh, Father Lassance he talks about a clouded telescope he says astronomers right they go out into the open air at a time when the atmosphere is perfectly clear the reason of course is apparent they, they, they want to be able to see the stars clearly right they want to be able to see the stars clearly. They don't want to be, you know, all messed up. They want to be on a solid foundation. It's not going to be t toppling all over the place. But he says that, that that idea that we keep the lens free of, of smoke and moisture, that same argument applies to the faith. And he says, how does it become dim? How does unbelief creep into the head and the heart? This is the question. And so he says, now listen to the answer. Who drifts into unbelief? Is it the men who spend their youth in prayer and study and then as priests of God set up an example to the world of a pure and blameless life? So if these people are doing that, okay, and they're living that life and they're truly striving after God, are they the ones who drift into unbelief? Is it the virgins consecrated to God? And look, you should appreciate, how often do you talk to your daughters, by the way, about becoming 
sisters and nuns. How often do you talk to them about religious vows? How often? How often do we bring our children to go visit any of them? To say, I, I want to have them in their life. We're going to go and we're going to actually allow our daughters to be that way. And I'm not saying that preaching at you because I, I'm really asking you, how do you guys do that? <laughs> because I don't do it as often as I should. They have, they have some sisters of divine mercy at the school, right? And they're awesome. And they provide a great example. But beyond that, unless they're in school and unless they happen to be in that class, they don't really see them that often. They don't pray with them. They don't make food with them. They don't go out and work in the fields with them. They don't go and work in the cities with them. There's no nothing with that. They don't go and, and see, what, what is your life like? How do you live? I'd like to know more. To get to know them more, to get to understand what they're doing. Because even most trad people are infected with modernity, with the, with, the, with the kind of modernity that in fact came from Protestantism that saw there was very little use. There was very little use in these groups out on the, uh, on the outskirts of town that were dedicating themselves to prayer. That's a, that's a life wasted. What are they doing just praying? What's that accomplishing? <laughs> Think about how stupid that is, by the way. But are those the people? Right? Is it the women who devote themselves in the solitude of the cloister to the contemplation of eternal truths? Is that what it is? Is it the courageous youths who do their utmost to safeguard the virtue of chastity and are careful to cleanse their consciences by a frequent reception of the sacraments? Is that who it is? No. No. Who drifts into unbelief? Those whose hearts are full of the smoke of sin. This is going to rankle the ever-living daylights out of unbelievers. <laughs> They're like, how dare you? How dare you? You're trying to tell me that I got sin in my heart? How dare you? <sighs> how dare you, buddy? You think you know the truth about that? I said, man, I'm not the one, you know, looking at some crystal ball. I'm not doing that. But we believe in a thing called revelation. We believe in a thing called truth. We believe in a thing called the, the church, and it's in, infallible. So when it talks about the anatomy of sin, even just from experience alone, you ain't having somebody who's like, I've been studying the truths. I've been dedicating my life to, uh, to prayer every day, to humility and prayer, and to chastity, and to all that, and the frequenting of the sacraments, the examination of conscience. I'm doing all those things, and you know what? I just think all of a sudden that maybe... You know, uh, it's really impressive to say, who created God? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. No. And, and it's not always, when people think sin, a lot of unbelievers will go, well, I'm not out there killing anybody. I say, well, you don't really understand what we mean by that, do you? Like, <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not saying, you know, that you're all Mr. Mustache in the middle. We're not all saying that. We're saying that, that there's a multiplicity of reasons, but at the core of all those things, at the core of all those things is a deprivation of God because your sin, a rejection of God because your sin, because your pride, because your desire to be your own law, in fact. And that's something everybody must fight with. That's not just unique to the, the person doing that. That's something that even the, the, the holy and the righteous, the people striving to be saints, that's what they got to deal with. There's no free lunch here. Somebody in the comments said, uh, Protestant work, uh, Corey, well, nice to see you, by the way, bro. Yeah, Protestant work ethic equals economic man and woman. Um, in large part, yes. Now, here's the thing. That work ethic, right, that idea was in part, in part, the notion that you were to, you were, you were a royal priesthood and that you were to work out these things. We see that, that's, some of those ideas have, in fact, uh, been Catholic all along, Right. So it's not uniquely Protestant in that sense, but that it, it kind of deputized people more, right? It kind of leveled. When you, when you level the various spheres of reli uh, uh, um, religious spheres, right? So you've got the sisters, you've got the brothers, you've got the, the priests and the bishops and all the groups and stuff. You've got all these different spheres and it's hierarchical. 
Okay, when you're leveling those things, it becomes almost purely economic man, including the idea that the pastor is an economic man. It's just a job. He's got to go. He's got to get his license for it. And that's about it. Or he can start his own business by starting a church at home. And nobody's really going to doubt that anymore. It's been it's been completely taken in by that. You know, and part of that part of that idea was that people, individuals had greater access. That leveling resulted in an idea that people have greater access even to things like books and that they needed to begin implementing things that were formerly reserved for priests and sisters and stuff. And um, we, Catholic people do that all the time. That's why, that's why I've told people, I said, there's times when I read books that are written to, from a saint to some ladies in a convent or some men in a monastery, that when I read that, I need to really keep that in mind. I don't just need to assume that it's the exact same thing as if that person were writing directly to me. In fact, that's a kind of a weird, Protestanty, prideful <laughs> idea, right? In some cases, in many cases, same thing. I see that stuff with Alphonse. People are like, oh man, I read about you know how how his instructions to priests and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, are you a priest? No, man, but dude, there's some great rules in there. I'm going to apply them. <laughs> you're like, okay, be careful though. Be careful. But good point. Yeah. Right here. It says, uh, those whose hearts are full of the smoke of sin, of the mist of evil passions, those who are averse to the holy truths of religion and detest its threats and admonitions on account of sinful lives they're leading. Yes, it is vice, evil, unruly, unbridled passions, which deprive men of their faith. And he says this is a modern dilemma. Right? Hence, we cannot wonder that there are in the present day so many Christians whose faith has grown cold or who've lost it altogether. And among their number are to be found, the sight fills me with grief and pain, many young men who went forth into life unspoiled and full of faith. We see how so many of them pander to their passions and they become slaves of vice. So of course, he's telling you to hold true He's saying, hold, hold true to the faith. Hold true to those traditions, the faith of your fathers. Hold true to those things. Do not allow that telescope, right? Do not allow it to become clouded through sin and vice. And he said, earnestly reflect that it is well to live a Catholic. It is well to die a Catholic. During the course of 1900 years, I, and just think about this for a second. Tell me if he's wrong. Tell me if he's wrong. During the course of 1900 years, no Catholic has ever thought of forsaking his religion upon his deathbed. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Actually, guys, uh, I'm dying here. And he's like, oh. he's like oh, one more thing. Come closer. Come closer. And little Jimmy by the bed is like, what is it? What is it, Papa? What is it? And he's like, a, a little bit. What is it? Just tell me. You're about to die. And he's like, uh, I don't want to be Catholic anymore. <laughs> no. No. And in that particular instance, little Jimmy might in fact have just cause to smack his papa in the face. <laughs> Whack! Smack in the face! It's what you got to do. <laughs> no. I don't think so. Not on your deathbed, homie. Oh, no. Ain't happening, man. Not unless somebody's got a gun to their head. I'm glad they said deathbed. Like, the assumption, of course, is that they're not being martyred. Because there are people, of course, we know the Donatist controversy was, in fact, part of that was how do you deal with the people who didn't want to die and so they turned over scrolls, right, that the church had. And some people believed, in fact, those, those books may have been, uh, you know, inspired scripture as far as they knew. And so they, you know, so we know that that happens. We know that people defect. And what do you do with those people? That's, it's, that's at the core. That's at the heart of that Donatist controversy like we talked about. You know? But on a deathbed, right? Assuming that it's a casual situation, the person's lived their life. Is anybody saying, I want to deny it now. <laughs> I don't think so. But many infidels and heretics return to the bosom of the church when they perceive the approach of death. And check out what he says beneath it. But do you remain faithful to your Catholic faith in thought 
word and deed even to your latest breath. <laughs> and I thought, come on, man. Come on. I didn't I didn't read that or highlight that part. I, I didn't to be honest, I didn't read the whole the whole book. I read a, major portions of the book, but I didn't read this particular part. And so I underlined that recently. Every thought, word, and deed, and I'm like, yeah, that's even the same order. <laughs> like, we, that's part of the, the mantra for the show. That's part of us saying, what do we do? We commit deep inside. Deep inside, we say, every thought, word, and deed. Momento mori. Remember, give it everything you got. Uh, we definitely have to be pushing for fatherless sons to be saying, <laughs> No doubt about it. Come on, guys. We got to do it. Start it right now. Start it right now. Never yield to human respect. Be fearless in the confession of your faith. Strive to edify others by living in accordance with your faith. The life of faith gives strength, consolation, and peace to the soul in the midst of the trials of life. Yeah. Because that can be hard, can it? How tough is it right now? Be honest. Because some of this, just be honest. Tell me, right? Tell me. Have you heard some of this stuff so much in your life that it's like in one ear, out the other sometimes? You need to live your faith. You need to pray. That you need to, you need to try to be a saint. How often have you heard that? Did it work? I mean, obviously... You're, you know, you're, you're probably like me, right? I'm assuming. I, I'll assume that I'm worse, right, out of charity, although I'm sure there's some of you who are much worse than me. <laughs> yeah, some of you guys, I'm like, I don't know about that person. I don't know about them. I've heard rumors, <laughs> you know, but uh, not, not really, maybe. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the thing is, is like, you know, how many of you have heard these things and yet you still live a life of not just, you know, occasional sin, but just outright despair? Do you really genuinely feel hopeless? For whatever you, you want in your life, whatever you're thinking in your life of what you want the world to be, do you look at it and you say, that's literally just a pipe dream. That's never going to happen. I can't even change the school board in my town. I can't even preserve that statue over there of a founding father. I can't keep the name of the school the way it was, of a saint or of you know a great conservative politician. I can't even do that. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, I, I understand like for myself, but what about everybody around me? And I think what's great about this is number one, he says there's a good reason to hope and has nothing to do with what, you know, in, in, a, in a way, has nothing to do with what you're doing. In fact, even all of those things around you that are happening, all of those things that you can mention, the craziness of, of the pokety poke, you know, thing, thing, <laughs> the, ah, don't get it near me, thing, thing, okay? Even the existence of that, even the existence of mandates, even if the existence of regulations and different things that may have, may have been the source of some of the most dramatic and traumatic experiences of your adult life. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you are someone who was afraid that they weren't going to be able to pay any of their bills. Maybe you couldn't. Maybe for the first time in your adult life, you had to call people to try to get help. I know you exist. And I'm going to say something. I'm not going to say something. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it on Lassant because he's saintly, not me. Even those things are reasons, especially those things, are reasons to have an even greater faith and an even greater hope. And not just because, well, I can use that in a utilitarian sense and kind of attribute it meaning. No, 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 no. Because it has meaning. Because providence is real. Because providence is no joke. God is a God of history. And history includes what happens to you and what happens to me. Sometimes we like to think, we, we say, look, 
You know, on, on one side of our mouth, we say, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood. And out of the other side of our mouth, we're rarely coming against those principalities and powers, unless we're at the end of a mass and we're saying the St. Saint, Saint Michael the Archangel prayer. And they're like, that's it. And I'm not meaning to say that's it in a way to diminish either the, the mass or that prayer. The greatest prayers, <laughs> I mean, major time power. But that it doesn't penetrate your life outside of that place. That's like, you know, how, how is that leaven that is going into the batch? How is that the case? That's like having, you, you got the seed in there. It's bursting with life. And yet you are the shoot. You are the branches. You're the one. The, the, the fruit of that spirit's going to work through you to create fruit, leaves. And those trees will be trees in such a way that are so large and so beautiful that even the birds of the air can make their homes in there. He's a God of history, even now, especially now. And, and not just to be like, well, he's prepping for the end. <laughs> the preppers might say that. They do. Not I. I say it's a big, a big maybe. It's always possible. I'm not going to say it's definitely not. That's cuckoo crazy pants. But to say that it's that paleocrat wager. It's the paleocrat wager. That if he's coming back today, at least we're ready because we're giving it all we've got. If he doesn't come back for a very long time, at least we were marching forward, fighting and praying with all of our might. In fact, let's flip that around. Praying and fighting with all of our might. He says there's a pious and pleasing legend. This is in the girls section. The girls section on hope, I, I think, is better than the, the one for men. When our first parents were driven out of paradise, they wandered about full of sadness and weeping. The earth was to be a scene of their toil, overgrown with thorns and thistles. It was a terrible sentence on them. And they said this, In the, uh, uh, in the sweat of thy face uh, shalt thou eat bread. That's the, the sentence of the, of the Lord, right, on their sin. So they're going to have to work. They're going to have to be doing the Johnny Q, Sally Sue thing, waking up early in the morning. They're going to have to be the ones, right, to get to the old grind, Another day, another dollar, elbow grease stuff. Coming home, dog tired. Or working from home, dog tired. Exhausted, struggling. Just to get the money to pay the basic bills. Just to get the money to feed their kids or to send them to school. Part of that is just simply not your fault. <laughs> In the grand scheme... In the grand scheme, okay, it says, then they sighed, talking about Adam and Eve, then they sighed, exclaiming with tears, alas, why did not the angel with the flaming sword put an end to our existence? How many times have you been there, by the way? How many times have you been to that place in your life where you sit there and you're like, why doesn't God just kill me already? <laughs> I've done it. God, I wish I would just die. Why don't I die? Why don't you just kill me, Lord, right now? <laughs> they're like, why didn't the angel, why didn't you just take us out? What a terrible, what a terrible lie. In, the, in fairness to them, that would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it? The experience that they had would be different from you and the two of us, or three of us, 20,000 of us. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to somebody. Personal. Suddenly there, bre there breathed forth from paradise a gentle breeze. The shrubs bent their heads in a tiny cloud, colored with the hues of the dawn, floated down from the hills. From this cloud a voice was heard to speak in accents of encouragement. Quote, Though your eyes will not be able to behold me, yet unseen by you, I will be your guide through life. I will dwell in your hearts and cheer your path. When thou, O man, dost till the ground in the sweat of thy face, I will show thee in the hazy distance waving fields of golden grain. You know what? If, if, you're, if you're in a place, obviously, again, not driving. <laughs> so nobody, if you're driving, do not do this, okay? Do not do this if you are driving, okay? 
But if you are able, and you're a man, okay, or a woman, we'll do because we're mixing it up, okay. But especially men, think hard about this one, okay. Oh man, dost till the ground in the sweat of your face. Go to work. Work that job. Sit at that desk. Answer those phones. Use those wrenches and hammers and nails. Drive that truck. Sell those items. Manage that store. And I will show thee in the hazy distance waving fields of golden grain and blooming gardens. And thou shalt fancy thyself in paradise. Think of where you are. Imagine for a moment. Take, open your eyes now. Just look around you, for real. Look around you where you are. See, see the situation you're in. Some people might be in really good ones. Some people might be in cuckoo crazy ones that they simply have to be in to make ends meet. But look around you, quietly scoping out the place. Almost like, almost like Neo in the Matrix, looking around to see where the Agent Smith is. <laughs> right? peek, peek over stuff. You're, you're looking like this. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> Do that. Look at all the people around you. Look at all of them and realize the sweat of your brow. It's hard, isn't it, sometimes when you look at a check and you see those numbers to realize that it was your sweat that did it. We, we feel a sense of that when, when the tax man cometh. We feel a sense of that. We get irritated. We get mad and say, oh, you know, this is not right. I worked for that. But in that moment, when you see that piece of paper with those little squiggles on it, do you really feel that same sense? Maybe you do. Maybe you're getting a billion dollars. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, oh, dude, I'm a billionaire. And I'm like, <laughs> how are you not a patron? <laughs> you're like, I am. I'm a $5. And I'm like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> you're a $5 patron. Billionaire. <laughs> but it's hard to see, isn't it? When you look at those people, is it hard to look past them and to realize, to realize what's ahead? Is it easy to look around you and to, and to feel like that Situation in the office, right? With the lady on the phone. Put you on hold. Can I help you? You know, the lady on the phone putting people on hold left and right. Thank you for calling, whatever. And it's annoying and it just goes all day long. And you look over and you see some dude over there that you don't really care for and you don't know much about his life, but he doesn't brush his teeth. His mouth smells worse, you know, <laughs> Smells worse than a lot of things that I won't say. I don't want to be grody. <laughs> See, really grody stuff, dude. What are you eating, bro? Something crawled in your mouth and died. Super, super bad in there. <laughs> I don't know what's worse. That or his armpit stench. You know, but you've got those folks. You got those folks that come up to you, your your manager, and your manager comes up and he's doing the mm, yeah. So he's doing that that game. You know, I'd like you to come to work this weekend. Mm, yeah. That kind of guy. That kind of dude who doesn't give you credit where you think it's due. Is it hard? Is it hard to look past them? Is it hard to see that you are not working for that person necessarily? You're ultimately working and doing those things for the Lord. And not just a heavenly thing. Fields of grain. Fields of golden grain. Blooming gardens. I believe that that I believe that that would be symbolism in that legend that would say the harvest is ripe. You are doing what you're doing in that work in what you do in your life and giving it everything you've got every day, not for those people, not for their, the eye pleasure, not to be like, I'm a people pleaser. I want, I want attention for that, but saying, God, you're the one who knows my heart. You're the one that knows I'm giving it everything I've got every day. My boss doesn't. I'm just another person. If I quit, they might not even know my name. But God does. He knows every hair on your head. He takes care of little birds. He takes care of flowers in the fields. Yeah, and in the comments, someone David says, uh, diet determines breath. Well, the guy's probably eating, you know, entire pouches of red man. <laughs> That's what I'm envisioning. I'm envisioning Snaggletooth kid, right? The rodeo guy. <laughs> and his breath is not smelling too good. 
And you're like, dang, son, you might have, like, you know, some kind of gingivitis. I'm not trying to dog on anybody with gingivitis. <laughs> you got to work on it, though. I, I get it, man. Yeah. But in the distance, you can see that your work and what you do, your life that's dedicated to prayer on your knees every day, on your knees every day, that you've got golden grain, those harvests, those fields ripe for harvest. You have those ahead of you. Same thing with the blooming gardens. I would think, look, I look at that as my kids. I look at that as my children. That I say, look, I, I, so it's not just heaven. Of course, these could be symbols of purely just heaven. I know heaven's going to be super amazing. That's not even a question. The question would be, okay, I do it for heaven. I know. I know. But is this purely transitory? Maybe. It might be. You might, you might literally live your life and never be any, not much wealthier than you are right now. You could make little little tweaks here and there. You could make certain decisions here and there, but there's no assurance that you're going to be just rolling in loot. There's no assurance of that. But there is an assurance that however you do make your money, you will make it by the sweat of your brow. And when now a woman, so now the, now the ladies, now the ladies, okay? And when thou, O woman, shall be in pain on account of bearing children, thou shalt behold an angel from heaven in the person of thy child, and you'll weep tears of joy. Alas, groan the unhappy ones, Adam and Eve. Wilt thou forsake us when we come to die, O hidden messenger of consolation? And the messenger said, no. Most certainly not. But after the darkness of night has passed away, a glorious morning shall dawn upon you. When the hour of your death is drawing near, my cheering light will illumine your soul, causing you to see the celestial portals open to admit you. They asked them, But who then art thou, celestial messenger of consolation? I'm hope, was the reply, the daughter of faith and love. I made a video called To Hope, and I'm only not showing it here because I know that there's a, I know that there's a very <laughs> crazy, it's pretty wild debate, and sometimes the folks can get really ticked off about, about skin in beautiful art. So like artwork, like Renaissance paintings, right? Um, all throughout history, any art that involves that. And there are some images in that video, stunningly beautiful images, nothing that's like, grotesque nothing that's like oh that's over the line that's really vulgar but there are a lot of people whose their lines are a little bit different and some people are like look they're not dressed in a potato sack so that's maybe pretty bad and, and they can say well no they're not wearing many clothes at all and you say well you know if i put on this would you be fine like no the shoulders are, are still showing <laughs> and you're like I, I knew it i knew it you want all the people to dress up like the folks in north korea i get it you should see their fashion shows you know, there's a point to that. I'm not entirely dogging it. <laughs> but the thing is, is it, it's where you are. It's where you are. But I'm not going to show it. But the idea, the idea is to hope that in these terrible times, these terrible things, that we are able to sit there and say, look, I, I have enormous amounts of hope. And not just, not just in the big things of life. Not just in politics. We call that big things. That's it's wrong. You know, sit there and say, you know, well, are you saying that we're going to have, you know, we're going to overturn all the laws we don't like? No. No, I'm not saying that. Are you going to say that we're going to take over the school and they're going to have prayers in public schools again? And I'm like, no, that's actually something you should maybe get out of your mind. <laughs> like, all the way, you should maybe consider alternative options at this point. And maybe that was a bad idea to begin with. It was kind of a little bit phony, to be quite frank. You know, that's that, <laughs> I mean, it, it's better than not. It's better than not. But the idea that that's where we, that's, we got to focus our effort on taking back the public schools. <laughs> no, no, you don't. You Maybe you should try to figure out more about homeschooling or more, for example, about classical education and figuring out ways to donate and support those so that they can broaden it so that it doesn't cost as much. <clears throat> we do that all the time. We, de we deal with that. 
We're very grateful for the assistance of the bishop. We're very grateful for the assistance of people who donate throughout the year. It's one of the reasons why it upsets me when people say, don't donate to different funds. Because that, that, those funds are actually helping us too. Stop buying Colgate. Stop buying airplane tickets. Stop buying almost anything from anywhere. Because if you base it off that same philosophy, those folks are even crazier worse. So give me a break. And David says, my mom's dresses were made from flower sacks. I'm not meaning to, to dog somebody, but I think that there's a, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't throwing your mom under the bus and I don't even know if you're lying. <laughs> Please dude, don't do that to me. I'm not trying to be mean to your mom, dude. You know, he's like, he's busting on my mom. <laughs> and you know what? The flower sacks are nicer, aren't they? <laughs> aren't, they? aren't flower sacks nicer than potato sacks? <laughs> I'm trying, dude. I'm trying. But there, you know, there are people who, who pull a, a Madame Guyon where she's like scratching her face to make herself, when she had the pox, she's scratching herself to get those scars to make herself more ugly because she was hot. You know, you know it's like one of those things. Not many people, not many people would like to say, you know, I'm a pretty attractive person. I think the way to get around that is for me to scratch myself. That is one way. I guess that is one way to do that. You know, when she was a girl, were they, did they do it on purpose? I'm talking about the flower sex. Did they do it on purpose? <laughs> I'm sorry for the aside, but this is actually, it plays into it a little bit. But So did they do it on purpose or was it simply a matter of their existence? Was it simply that it was, they were going through the depression maybe? Or that they were very poor, or that they lost someone in the family? Yeah. But the idea here, right, is that this virtue of hope, we got to cling to it. We got to hold to it with all of our might. And he says, for the same reason that St. Ambrose, in order to encourage us, writes the follows, quote, Behold what a judge thou hast. The Father hath committed all judgment to the Son. How then can God condemn you who redeemed you with his blood? who gave himself for you. When St. Augustine thought about the sins of his youth, his heart grew heavy and full of fear. When you, when you think of your own life, you know, when you think of your own life, it's not just, you know, I'll, I'll say for me, when I think of it, I don't want to, you know, force words into you guys' mouth. But to say, you know, you have your own experiences and I'd love to hear about them and stuff. But like, I know there's been times where I've gotten so frustrated, feeling like I can't, affect the world at all, feeling like the world is so out of control and there's nothing we can possibly do and we got to just, you know, run out in the middle of the desert somewhere, you know, throw, throw uh, dust over our heads and there's a point for that, right? Ashes and stuff, there's a point for that. But not as just the default setting. Not as the default setting. And I've gotten so upset about it and said, look, you know, um, how could I possibly do anything? I'm just a sinner. Well, obviously, but even if I wasn't, even if I, let's say I was living the most holy life in the universe. Let's say I was like super dope. I was super dope. And I'm just, I'm rocking it out. I'm hardly ever sinning at all. I'm doing a bunch of great works. Even those things are in the eyes of God, who has the hand on history and providence, are in the eyes of God. They're filthy rags. They're filthy rags. And, and by, by comparison, he doesn't hate you for it. He demands you to do it. He calls us to that. But you're not impressing him with the way you shine your shoes. <laughs> you're, not, you know, you're not impressing him going, hey, Lord, look at us. Look at this. You see this? This is worthy of, of all that grace you've got. <laughs> then you've defied grace. You've, defined, you've, you've redefined it. You've defied it by redefinition. And yes, David the Hermit, thank you, man. Thank you. You said yes. They were very poor. That that's totally understandable. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote and but very rich in their faith. Maybe your mom was someone who learned from somebody who who read this book because it, it, I'm gonna end today with a, a particular um, quote that's awesome. Right about that. Hope in him when all else seems hopeless. Having him such a firm implicit confidence as Susanna had in her dreadful distress. Everything seemed to have conspired 
to compass her ruin. She could, humanly speaking, hope for no deliverance, yet her confidence in God remained unshaken, firm as a rock. The Holy Scripture tells us she, weeping, looked up to heaven, for her heart had confidence in God, and yet, and yet she wept. She's able to look at this and recognize that, that this is a terrible situation. She's not oblivious to it. This isn't like this naivete, man. This is, this is a realism that says you are able to look at the situation and recognize just how bad it is, how helpless it looks. And you're able to do with the boys in the fiery furnace. You're able to do like them and say, we believe that the Lord can save us. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, We're not going to take a knee for the king. We're not going to bow because we have one king. We have one God and king. So they knew that fire. They could probably feel the heat when they said it. They could could probably hear the roar of that fire, the crackling, the dread. Maybe maybe they'd heard people before, you know, people who got too close to it. (laughs) You know, I mean, obviously, imagine the sounds Imagine the terror in that moment. It's like waiting in line, an execution line. You're hearing people get shot, but not shot very well. And so they're going to die, but they're in a lot of pain first. And how that would affect you. And yet, what do they say? In that situation, did they have any hope? Do you think that they were going to be like, all right, guys, kung fu time. Wah! You think they were going to do that? Karate chopping people's necks. Giving people the uppercut. Saying, boom, 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 I'm out of here, run, guys. <laughs> we got to go start a commune. <laughs> no, they didn't do that. They stood at that furnace and said, look, the situation looks bleak. The situation looks mad bad. But God is in control. My here. I know full well, my dear daughter, that you uh, who are about to embark on the stormy sea of life will encounter many a trial, many a conflict, many an affliction. I know that sorrow is going to come to you and to those who are near and dear to you. I also know how easy it is for an inexperienced young girl to grow fretful and disheartened in such hours of suffering and to say within herself, God's not treating me in a just or kind manner, but like a harsh stepfather. You must be armed ahead of time. against this insidious temptation. And by the help of God, you must engrave upon your heart the words, God doeth all things well. Do you feel that way? Do you look around and see all that stuff we've talked about thus far, all that stuff on the news? When you hop online or you read a newspaper or you turn on the TV or do anything like that, When you go and you talk to people in the world and you're driving down the street and you're seeing signs all over the place with all the things that the world is throwing your way, with all of those things, do you feel sometimes like God is not treating you right? Why do I deserve this, Lord? Why me? Why do I deserve this, God? I learned that is not a very good question. (laughs) Sometimes they'll show you the reasons why. And sometimes those reasons why will embarrass you because sometimes those reasons why are because of things that are sinful in our lives and mere consequence of the situation we're in. But sometimes because he has glorious plans for us. And we don't understand that. And we're presumptuous ahead of time. We presume ahead of time. In fact, he's got a, um, he's got a story. Let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can just grab it. Nah, he, he tells a story basically about a kid, right? And if I, if I see it ahead of time, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll take it out. So he, he's, you got a kid, right? And the kid goes and he, he's got, he's got a briar. He's trying to put his, his hands in to get these flowers and stuff. And he pricks his finger and he's, ah, no, 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 no. and he's real mad. Why did you break that up? I'm a, this thing's hurting me bad. And you go and they're, they're mad at the, the thing. And then mom comes up and says, was it this? Yeah. And she goes to that little, little prick, right? And just kind of snaps it like that, right? That little thorn. Snaps it off and then takes it 
and clips at an angle, takes that flower and gives it to the kid and said, do you feel it now? No. Are you mad? No. That's how we are. (laughs) That's how we are. We don't even understand that those flower bushes are growing so that our, our, our papa and our mama, our king and our queen, that they are able to provide us with great blessings, with things that were designed for us to bless us, to enlighten us, to encourage us, to enliven our faith, and ultimately to lead to that place where we can enjoy their presence forever and the presence of those people that we love, that we miss. But we still complain in the moment. We still get so upset in the moment. St. Jerome says it this way, what we take to be a poison is in reality a medicine. In, In fact, afflictions are blessings in disguise. Do you look at afflictions that way? I mean, be serious with me. Be serious with yourself, please. This is an urgent moment. This is something that if, if we can look at it differently and say, look, it's not to say that that stuff isn't there. We're just seeing it for what it really is. We're seeing that it's more. It's, 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 almost, like, it's almost like the Eucharist. Like we can look at it and say, yeah, look, I can see the shape of the bread. I can see and maybe smell the wine. But it's more than that. There is something spiritual at play here. There is something at the core of this moment in our life that is not just purely this wicked thing and that is even there for the betterment of ourselves. Even sometimes, I've said this before, that that when it gets bad and people are promoting abortion and people are contracepting themselves out of existence, they don't understand that that is part of of a curse. That that, in fact is part of a design where unbelievers, by their own nature, will weed themselves out. So you keep making babies. You keep raising them in the fear of the Lord, trusting in the promise that if you raise them in that, that they will continue in those ways. Admitting that there's bound to be a percentage more often than not that will not. So make a bunch of babies. (laughs) We're still going to outlive it. That's why even secular philosophers... Philosophers of history, Oswald Spengler. Nobody's saying that guy was like a hardcore loving the Lord Catholic guy, (laughs) right? And he's talking about civilizations. He's talking about how groups go away and what happens in the craziness of it all, the decline of the West. And what does he say? The people that emerge from that, what are they? They're the ones that hold fast to the faith of their fathers. Why? Why? Even unbelievers have to see this. The patterns of history end up showing it time and again. You can see it. Just like you can see the fingerprint of God on creation, you can see the fingerprint of his providence in these, in these ways that things flesh themselves out in space and time. So you look at it, and you say, it's super bad. Peter in the comments says, during the climate change conference in Glasgow... Not a word was mentioned that 60 million abortions are happening each year. But you know it. You know, I, look, I agree with you. I agree, right? But I'm not on that planning committee. I'm not picking those people. I wouldn't have picked the people that were there. I wouldn't have picked the themes that were there. And I don't even want to give too much credit where that thing's due. Because maybe that maybe. That conference is affecting more people in the world, to be honest, more people who are aborting themselves out of existence anyway. It's going to die. I wish I remembered in the, in the Liturgy of the Hours what it was. There was a, uh, there was a, a, um, a quote, I think it was St. Ephraim, I think, that was talking about how the unbelievers and, and, and the Bible verse that associated with it. It was, it was remarkable, but it was talking about how unbelievers weed themselves out when they reject God and they start worshiping nature, when they ex- exchange the truth for a lie, when they cover their eyes in a great act of self-deception, 
When they do that, they place themselves in such a state of sin with no recourse and resolve, with no way of of reconciling, with no way of renewing themselves. They're just on the track, the irreversible path of that. And when they do, what's the end of that? It's death. It's death. So when these people believe that, okay, look, those people are out there not making kids. Those people are out there and they are aborting the kids like crazy. They are contracepting the kids like crazy. They are LGBTQIA plus everything else, their kids like crazy. Tranifying the kids like crazy. And when they do that, that is going to make it, you are not going to have a bunch of children. The family values are gone. They don't have that. Unbelievers with a secular worldview and an eminent frame, they look at this world as, well, we might get blown up by an asteroid any day now. A meteorite any day might come and just clobber us and we're done. There's no God to control that. They're afraid of that. They're afraid, hey, white privilege. Because of white privilege, uh, you know, I'm not going to make any more kids. That is like terror. Or climate change. I don't want to make any more kids because of climate change. So it, it doesn't matter. Whatever the reason is, they're going to have it. They're going to have it. And what are you going to do? That's the question. What are you and what am I, what are we going to do? Keep marching forward. We have to keep marching forward. We have to keep making those kids, raising them up, laying that foundation, equipping them, equipping them. Yeah, Andrew says, amen, Jeremiah. This is why I have hope for Christ Church. Our children and big families are the future. You better believe it. Yeah, antinatalism is a movement. So are we, though, aren't we? I'm serious. So are we right here. We are that right here. This is a movement, a way to, of looking at things and saying, look, this isn't, this isn't a grand scheme. There's no grandiosity here. We're not saying like, hey, man, we're going to go, and if we just do the thing with the wolf pack and we do this stuff here, then all of a sudden it's just going to magically change, and we're going to be like royals walking down the street, and they're going to be like, yeah, that's the guy with that show that started it all. No, 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 no. Little bit by little bit by little bit. Like, <laughs> like St. Padre Pio. In that little manual I used to have talking about the, the work of the, the mother who's, who's knitting something one loop by one loop by one loop. You know how slow of a process that is. Now, maybe they're, maybe they're knitting fast. Okay? All the different ways that ladies can use needle and string. And how, how difficult that can be, the embroidering and stuff. All of that, little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit into a grand design. But little bit. One cloth here, one rosary there, one statue, one painting. Children, 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 one, you know, one or more at a time, you know. <laughs> you, might, you might have octuplets, <laughs> let's hope. That's something a lot of people, they're like, I only want to have, you know, I'll get pregnant once. And I'm like, we're all praying to you have octuplets. <laughs> it's true, I'm not lying. Uh, <laughs> we really need to do that. You know, so the thing is, though, is that you, if you add those things together, one Bible, one altar, next thing you know, you got a family altar, one prayer, one day at one time. Guess what? You now have a family around, around a family altar doing prayers. Builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. And eventually, look, you beautified your home. You have, you have instilled that faith within those around you, given them a sense of beauty and purpose in a world that is literally spiraling without it, mad, drunk on its own sin. Now it's the art of making socks. The art of making socks. The art of making clothes. The art of making, you know, little little crosses to put make patches for people. People think, oh, that's, that's just a little arts and craftsy stuff. And you go, yes. That, those people, man, get back to that. If that's what it takes, if that's what it takes, you use your gift and your talent to the best of your ability. Give it everything you've got. And show those children. See those golden fields. See those b- blossoming gardens. See your actions bloom. 
See through your manager. See through the people that bother you. See through the news. See through the tweets. See through it all and see Christ the King. See Calvary. Because you want to talk about someone who didn't have control. Well, he could have. But he abandoned the control. He abandoned it to God. He said, let your will be done. He is surrounded by soldiers. He is is in that place and he subjects himself to that. And why? Because he knows that the will of God is best. And because he could see through that cross, he knew. He went through pain, extraordinary pain. We know this. We pray the sorrowful mysteries, right? Right? We know this deep inside. How many times have you cried imagining the lashings? How many times have you cried watching the passion and seeing uh, you know, uh, seeing an icon or a religious image of this or looking up at a crucifix and bawling your brains out because you imagine the man, you behold the man, the man who subjected himself to the worst, nothing. I don't even have to add to it. The worst calumny, the, la- the, the, the worst pain, the worst suffering. The worst betrayal. It's just the worst. It is just the worst that he subjected himself to. We are nothing compared to this. Nothing. I look at it and I think, I told somebody. I said, look, we go through our time. Somebody, a a, a friend of mine, someone I consider a real friend, and they're an awesome person. So they're hearing this and they might. I love you. Right? As a friend. <laughs> As a friend. Going through a hard time. And I'm only using this as an example. Right? Being really depressed about stuff. Feeling that there's no answer. Maybe they'll never get married. Maybe people won't love them. They're not sure what they're going to do with their life looking for a job, looking for that, getting really sad about it and upset about it and and kind of lashing out, in fact, you know, in a way that was actually pretty good. I, I, I agree with this person. This person did these things that I'm talking about, right? Uh, this person, I'm not assuming that this person didn't. This person did a lot of the things I'm about to say. But when you're going through those things, I've told people before, and let's just put it generally, when you're going through all those things, you are, you're going through the ringer. You lost your job. You're being threatened. You're not able to be, you, you aren't even able to leave the country. I know some folks that were going to become uh, a part of a religious order. And what happened? They get locked inside their own country because of the, you know, thing, the thing, thing. And so what happens? They're, they're, they're sad about it, right? I mean, it would be, it would be heartbreaking. People, people who lose their jobs, who lose money, who lose their homes, their family businesses, who have to look at their kids. Imagine driving home. Maybe you're one of those who drove home from work realizing that you had to hand your keys over to somebody because you could no longer pay the rent. And you had to tell the kids. And you had to look your wife in the face and tell her too. In those situations, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to weep. It's a valley of tears. And I go one further. I say, literally, go outside. Go outside in the dark. Slam your fists on the ground with everything you've got. Get on the ground. Knees just muddy and dirty. Fists slamming over and over and over. Shaking your fist. Feel. Feel the tears streaming out. Grit your teeth to the point you're afraid it's going to crack weeping, growling on the ground, punching it, shaking. Shake your fist at heaven. Do it. Shake your fist. Why? Do all that. Say, why, God? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? What did I ever do to deserve this? Get it all out with everything you've got. Then reach in your pocket and grab a crucifix and look at the man. Look at him. Behold the man. And feel ashamed. 
It is nothing. It is nothing compared. And he, he and that moment, that symbol, that is what is being raised up. That is what is drawing all people. That is where we find our hope. We've got this. We've got this. There are some other ones. I'll I'll share the stuff that I I didn't share. I'll share that in the Wolfpack chat. So make sure to make sure to check it out. But I wanted to say, um, let's see here. There was it was one more thing, and I'll I'll end on this. Okay. About not murmuring. You know, to abandon yourself. We've talked about it. Right here, St. Ignatius of Loyola. All that is bitter, all, uh, all that is bitter, as well as all that is sweet in this life, comes from the love of God. And by the way, David the Hermit, I'll share the, uh, oh, I don't even, I don't think you're over on Telegram, are you? Uh, if you can email me, man, I'll send you, I'll send you this, this quote, I, you know, talking about many a young girl longs to be smartly dressed. I'll just say it now. I'll say it now. Cause I said I would to be arrayed like one of the lilies of the field. Instead of this, she perhaps has to wear shabby old fashioned clothes, which make her look more like a dull weed than a bright flower. Let her not give way to discontent. For God may have ordained that she is to wear this unpretending raiment because he destines her to blossom one day as a beauteous lily in the fair garden of paradise. Another maiden is jilted by a man. In her sad and lonely hours, she turns to some book or spiritual reading such as the following of Christ, which I'm wondering if that's the same as just the imitation of Christ, I'm assuming. Had God not laid this heavy cross upon her, she might perhaps be reading a very different kind of book. In adversity, even more than in prosperity, must we say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was said by a great master of the spiritual life that one single act of submission to the will of God made in adversity is worth a thousand such acts uttered amid prosperity. Isn't it easy? It's easy to say you trust in God when everything's going good. I challenge you. I challenge you like God is challenging me. All right, we're in this together. It's not, I'm not some boss. I'm not some, you know, I'm a guy with a microphone that loves reading books with people and telling some stories and it, encouraging people to have a bright side, to be a glad trad. To, I, Jacob Fowler, he showed me, that he mentioned that yesterday. I was like, glad trad, dude? Glad, tra- glad trad of the divine right? Yeah, that's us. <laughs> we are, we're glad tradders. We are glad tradders of the divine right. And I, it's, it's easy, right? I mean, it's kind of hard not to be a glad trad when you're drinking this uh, <laughs> Tridentine brew, right? It's one of the many things. Yes, because life is worth living. Yeah. Fulton Sheen. Mm-hmm. Irish Red Ale. Mm. Right here. You must look behind in order to see what you have been and still are, namely a sinner. You have to remember. Who can dare indulge in complaints and just... I I feel this like crazy because I, I fall all the time. And pray for me, by the way. We're praying for you. If you want prayers and you want us to mention them by name... It doesn't matter. We, you know, if you say my kids or my family or someone, I even someone, it was somebody who said, yeah, I saw this on a discord <laughs> server or whatever. Send it. You can find that at telegram. The, the link is in the description below to the Wolfpack chat. And if you join that Wolfpack, chat, it's a free app and it's fun. You'll meet a lot of people, but it's not just about the fun. It's literally that we pray, we read books together, we share resources and we're on this path together. We're trying to be saints. We're, we're, it's kind of a little bit of a, a sandbox, like David Aleva said. It's a little bit of a sandbox, right? I've provided this space <laughs> that says, look, guys, come on in and play. We're going to have a party in here, and everybody's bringing their toys, and we're, ha- we're making castles together for the Lord. 
And sometimes bullies come and might kick it down. But we all look up at that person and we say, here, here's a shovel. Do you want to help us? We, we have the opportunity to build it again. This actually gives us better experience because we're learning again. And the person's like, you're supposed to be mad. And we're like, yeah, we're kind of learning to see things differently. And we look at each other and wink because we all know. We're getting it. You must look behind in order to see what you have been and still are, namely a sinner. Marvelous is the power contained in the thought, I am a sinner. Who can dare to indulge in complaints and impatience? Who can dare? This is... That's what I'm saying. This guy's a saint, right? Because we all do. We all dare, don't we? Don't we all dare all the time to complain? Don't we dare to be impatient? And why? On account of temporal losses and sufferings. Oh. Well, conscience is telling him that his abode ought to be in hell. Or at least in purgatory. Because he's deserved such a lot over and over and over. And in my case, over and over and over and over and over and over ad infinitum, ad nauseum by his sins. But you also got to look before. So not not just to, because otherwise you'll get trapped in that, right? Trapped in the, I'm a sinner. I'm a wicked, wicked, bad guy. I'm a wicked, bad girl. That's true, right? But we're not, we're not Protestants who believe that you're a big mound of manure that's sprinkled with diamonds and gold. You are infused with grace. You are infused with God. And contemplate one who is bearing his own cross and who will help you to carry yours. He's ready and willing to do this. The mere sight of him will lighten your burden. He carried a very heavy cross up a steep hill, pale and exhausted though he was, under the load, yet he bore it. So it's not just to see the end of it. It's not just to see the crucifix, but how he got there. It's one of the reasons why we're so blessed to have the rosary, isn't it? Isn't it? Meditate upon his sufferings and you'll be ready to suffer here on earth. And today's a good day to do that, by the way. Today's a good day to do that. I think I'm going to pray the rosary over at the Wolfpack chat. If you want to join me, head on over. He trod the way of the cross before you. Do you follow his footsteps? Then look down to the abodes of everlasting torments, down to hell, where the lost souls dwell. Think also of purgatory where the suffering souls are detained, especially this month, by the way. Pray for them. Is it not far better to suffer a little here on earth than after death to endure? And finally, look up to heaven. Behold the eternal beauty and the blessedness of paradise. If for a brief period you suffer here with courage and patience, you will after death be released from all suffering and enjoy unspeakable bliss forevermore. And it's a humiliating thing if you think about it, especially when we get mad at God for all these other reasons and stuff, that when we, when we cave to sin, how, how fleeting of a moment so many of those pleasures really are. Think about it. How fleeting of a moment. Now, look, God, God designed us in such a way, you know, dopamine and stuff. It's a, it's a heck of a drug, son. It is, right? You, you like the feel-feels of that. Nerve endings are pretty dope. And nerve endings are like, woo, baby, <laughs> this feels good. But it's fleeting. It's fleeting. It's all out of whack. And when it's over, so often people will just feel like, why did I do this? It was here and it was gone. And that's an analogy of your life. At least with <laughs> here as we see now, you will open your eyes on another side. And you must make sure you work with all your might to endure this present darkness. So visit the churchyard, my dear daughter, this is to the women, where so many crosses and gravestones remind you of the life to come, especially this month. Go do that. Yeah, seriously. We're going to go. 
I'm going to go down to Battle Creek, and I want to I want to take this month especially to go to my my daughter's grave. But also, we have we have graveyards up the road. I'd like to go. Maybe I'll even go there and do the rosary today. Because it's right up the road. It's not far. Pause beside the tomb of a Christian maiden who led an innocent and pious life. And this is the final frame. But who was misunderstood and despised by those around her and who had much to suffer while on earth. If you could ask her, imagine this. If you could ask this person who was misunderstood, despised, people didn't like this chick. If you could ask her whether she were willing to return to this world in order to begin a new but happier existence, what would she reply? <laughs> no. <laughs> she would answer, not, not for anything in the world. No way, Jose. What are you talking about? Coming back here? I'm in heaven. What? <laughs> no, I don't think so. For what could be a better lot for me than that which gained for me eternal bliss in heaven? And that's the thing. Would you Would you rather come back even if you could go to heaven? And she said, no, this is how I got here. This taught me those lessons. It's like I've said of my brother with his accident when the person told me that, well, your brother is severely mentally handicapped and, and disabled because because of sin in your life or in your parents' lives and stuff. And I said, my brother is better. My brother is a better Christian than you. He does not sin the same way as you. He doesn't struggle with the same problems and inclinations. It's like the homeboy's got on a fast track. <laughs> He's got on a fast track to heaven. The guy loves God for real. And what's the worst he's got? He gets grumpy, fair, fair enough. He gets grumpy if he can't, you know, watch something, right, that he wants to watch. Or it's taking too long to eat. Or a bunch of kids are complaining around him and they're crying and causing, you know, crazy ruckus. Those are, those are, <laughs> that's the worst he's got. That's the worst he's got. People look like scumbags compared to him. Why? Because they are scumbags compared to him. I don't look at that as, you know, I, I see that and say, was it painful? Yes. Are there parts of me that wish that he wouldn't have gone through it? You better believe it. I would have had a different kind of younger brother. I would have had a younger brother that could drive to my house and hang out with me. You know, he'd have, he'd have, he'd have kids. I'd have nieces and nephews through him. So if you think that that means that I'm like, well, there's nothing that I could imagine that would have been great going a different direction. But you know what? Life doesn't work that way. He went to go get a haircut and came back in a coma. After, after you know, basically a year away from home into a completely different home. It wasn't even the same house we were in when it happened. That's how much time happened. How many bad things happened. And yet, what do we see? I see my brother and I say, man, thank God, dude, for him. I love that guy. He's changed my life. In the end. The end of it all. Right. And thank you, by the way, for, for being here. If you too, my dear young friend, have already much to suffer, rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Be glad in it. And don't just say those words. Stop doing it. That's why it's cliche because so many people just say it. They, they, they sit there and they say, I'm so mad. I'm so upset. I'm suffering right here. And I hardly ever hear anybody say, man, you know what? I have, I'm actually suffering, dude. For real. Did you read in the Bible about suffering? And we say, that's crazy. And you're like, well, it is, it's crazy to the world that doesn't rejoice. <clears throat> it's crazy to the world. It's crazy to the control freak that's wanting to control everything around them to the prideful person that believes that because they're able to have a Twitter or able to have a Facebook that they should be making big decisions for everybody around them. Rejoice. Rejoice. Endure all things with patience. And the sure conviction that patience bears blessed fruits and fruits of endless joy. Do as you are bidden to do in the following lines. 
I love these little lines he's got in his book too, by the way. If you if you buy the book, let me know. You know, I, I wanna I wanna actually reach out to do and if you got a, a publisher you got it through, let me know that too. You know, if it's a leather bound or paperback or whatever, I'd like to see different ones and start sharing those so that we can promote it because we've already had a bunch of people buy it. We've had a bunch of people buy it. But here's the end, the last lines. If God should send thee grief or pain, seek thou his purpose, wise to know. Eternal love will not in vain cause thy bitter tears to flow. Yeah. Yeah, it won't. It's not going to leave you. God's not going to leave you hanging. He's not going to leave you hanging. All right, we make mistakes all the time. You can't trust in chariots and horsemen. You can't even trust. You can't put, don't put your trust in me. Don't put your trust in Tim Flanders. Don't put your trust in all that. You, uh, pray for us. Rejoice that we're doing what we do. We are, we're rejoicing. We're grateful for all of it. We're grateful. But don't put your trust in that. What's the point of that? No more chariots and horsemen, but the king, the general of all things, that's dividing that's, that's dividing the wicked and the good, that is working that divine providence over all of mankind, over you and over me, over all the things that we experience and see, that it's him, that it's him, his plan, his time, his will, and we just let it up to him. Pray for me today. You know, I'm trying to do this too. I need to. I'm preaching to myself. I see myself in this picture. I see myself pointing like that. It's in me. <laughs> I don't see any of you, but I do see that guy. And that guy definitely needs all this stuff. <laughs> He's struggling. He's struggling. Well, pray for me today because we have a uh, situation. Oh, no. My my one thing's gone. Okay, well, we just got that. I, I'm praying uh, today, and I'm asking you to pray because I'm doing a speech about enthusiasm. Ronald, Th- Ronald Knox's book, his magnum opus, and uh, super, super excited about it, but I'm nervous too, right? So pray that I give it my best, that I see this as a good reason to rejoice, and that even if I do bad, especially if I do bad, that I say it's okay, and maybe with a smile and a twinkle in my eye. Until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.